Habakkuk is one of the minor prophets. Uh, he is the author. He's not mentioned other pl- in any other place in the Bible, but the um, we see that his quotes he's quoted uh, through the Bible uh, quite a few places. And the uh, the theme here is the of the book is the just shall live by faith. And we will that is the title of the message this morning. And we will under, uh, remember that, that uh, Paul quotes that quite a bit, and we'll look at that a little bit later. So the, uh, the book of uh, Habakkuk, that is the theme there, the just shall live by faith. Now the, um, okay, so here we go. It's a unique from any other uh, of, the, of the minor prophets in that it's a prayer journal. We can see that two-thirds of this book, as we're going to see, is a dialogue between Habakkuk and God. It's initiated by Habakkuk and God answering him. So we see that he's bewildered and perplexed in the things he sees. He's confused, and he's, he takes it to the Lord, and he has questions for God, and he could be called the prophet with questions. Uh, So this book tells us of his personal journey here, how he struggles with uh, how God is good when there's so much evil and tragedy in the world. And that is very true today, very relevant. We can look at all the evil and the tragedy in the world and we can look around and see and say, where is God in all of this? And and I believe others in the Bible like Asaph and Psalm 73 had the same similar questions, you know, like, why do the wicked prosper? And this is where Habakkuk is. He's a pro- the prophet with a, a problem. So we're going to see him. He's going to go from questioning to trusting God to praising God. And that's the three points this morning. Habakkuk questions God. Habakkuk trusts God, chapter 2. Uh, and chapter 3 is where we're going to see Habakkuk praises God. He ends up with praising the Lord with an outstanding testimony of faith. So there's the, uh, the, three, the three points that we want to look at this morning. But the first one is that Habakkuk questions God. And let's read a couple verses out of Habakkuk 1 in, in chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, The burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou wilt not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou wilt not save. Why dost thou show me in why dost thou show me iniquity and cause me to behold grievance for spoiling and violence are before me and and there and there are they that raise, raise up strife and contention therefore the law is slacked and judgment doth never go forth for the wicked doth compass about the righteous therefore wrong judgment proceedeth so here we can see he starts out by, by saying, how long shall I cry? And that was like Jeremiah's cry, how long? We can see here he, was, uh, he must have been praying about this a while. And, you know, sometimes we too can pray about something for a while and we just don't have answers. Or we see that uh, God doesn't seem to hear. But we see here his how long, we see his humanness and his impatience and Basically, his first question comes down to this. How is it possible for so much evil and injustice to exist in Judah? And God, you don't seem to do anything about it. You know, his first basic question complaining here was the state of Jerusalem, the state of the, of, uh, the people of God and the, the city of God, Jerusalem. You know, the verses that we just read here, it doesn't, it, it gives a brief description. Some other prophets give a lot more detail of the, of the wickedness that was going on in that time. But there was idolatry, there was immorality, there was injustice, there was violence. And I believe you could sum it up as anarchy. And there was a number of wicked kings after each other and just led the people a downhill. And uh, there was a cultural decay. And this is what was bothering Habakkuk. And, you know, we can look at this example here and we can liken it to today. Isn't that what we see today? Violence abroad, violence everywhere, injustice. You know, the wickedness is abounding. And this is what Habakkuk was in, in the middle of. 
And he's saying that the, the law is slacked in verse four. You know, the law is not working. It's the NIV would say it's paralyzed. It's just not working. The law was given to, uh, to restrain evil and it wasn't working. And in, in the latter part of verse four there, it says and wrong judgment proceedeth. Uh, so their justice was not being, uh, was not prevailing. Violence was filling Jerusalem, and that's like what we see today. You know, violence in our streets and injustice. The, uh, the wicked were surrounding the righteous, and Habakkuk was troubled by this. And it comes back to this, uh, to this last the, the question, how is it possible for so much evil and injustice in Judah? And God, you don't seem to be doing anything about it, was what, is, uh, his, what it came down to. God... Or you're doing too little. And he says, you know, how long? He's crying out, how long? You know, God, why are you making me look at this injustice and violence and you're not doing anything about it? And I'm praying about it. Now, one thing we need to notice is that he takes it to the Lord. It's the best place for him to go with it. And it's the best place for us to go with a, uh, uh, with a question or with a complaint. You know, we can take it to people and they can sympathize with us and they can argue or whatever, but God will hear us and he will tell us as he told Habakkuk here. So one thing that we see is in, in verse three, it starts with a why. And you know, all of our questions start with a why. You know, why, the why keeps coming up. Why this and why that? It's just a common question when we talk to God. And let me say here that it's, it's not wrong for us to ask questions, you know, to ask God why. Jesus asks God why. Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? David said the same thing. Uh, what Darrell was reading this morning in our devotional, you know, David had some of the same questions and I believe he said the very same thing. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Job had why questions. So if God can handle our why questions, you know, fathers enjoy their children coming to them and asking why, why this. That's not what. That's not irritating to a father. But our, one of the. But we shouldn't stay there in the questions. You want that questioning to move on to trusting, and that's what we're going to see. God wants us to trust Him, and uh, and then ultimately to praise Him. But if we stay in the questioning stage, it's going to frustrate us. Uh, it, we're going to lack peace, we're going to lack faith, and we're going to lack joy. So what it really comes down to is our lack of understanding. Habakkuk just didn't know everything that was going on at the time. Just like children, just don't understand everything. You know, there's uh, from mom and dad, you know, uh, they just have to trust mom and dad. Catch up here. Uh, our lack of understanding, you know, Jesus, uh, the, the Bible says, of God, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts high, are higher than your thoughts. You know, there's some things on this side of heaven that we will just not understand. God, God doesn't give us the full explanation of everything. We, we are not able to comprehend everything. And so it's not gonna make sense to us, but it makes sense to God. So our, our why questions are simply saying, I don't understand everything. You know, it's good that we have quest, uh, scriptures like this included in the Bible to show us that even the prophets, we think these prophets, we put them up on a pedestal and they had their act together and they did everything just right. But they were ordinary men like you and I. You know, we have, they, Habakkuk had questions and he was confused and it's encouraging for us to read this in the Bible, to know that Habakkuk wrestled with some questions. And it's the same questions that I believe all of us at some point in our lives, and maybe someone right now is wrestling with, you know, God, why, why did God allow this? Or why did I lose my child? Or why did my child get cancer? Or, or why, why, why didn't God intervene? Why, why do the wicked prosper? You know, Habakkuk just couldn't reconcile this bad world that he was in, surrounded by with a good God. And that's exactly what Asap in Psalm 73 had the same similar questions. 
You know, why do the wicked prosper is what he was trying to wrestle with. And why does sin go on? Why must we suffer because of sinners? You know, will, will righteousness and justice ever prevail? You know, Habakkuk says to God, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like he's not doing anything about it. Why isn't God doing, what, what is God, why is he doing nothing is the essence of his complaint. But God answers him in verse six, uh, verse uh, five. It says in verse five, uh, God answers, behold ye among the heathen and regard and wonder marvelously for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe though it be told you. So here God did answer him and he says, look out, look out, zoom out, broaden your view, Habakkuk. Don't be so narrow-minded. Look at history. Uh, for them here, it would have been looking at, remember the Northern Kingdom 120 years earlier when God's judgment came on them. So God's saying, I am doing something. I am doing something. And, and he says that it's going to be in your lifetime, in your days. And then he says, you wouldn't believe it if I explained it to you. Now, Paul quoted this verse uh, in, in Acts, not word for word, but, you know, to the unbelieving Jews, for I will work a work in your days, a work which you shall in no wise believe, though a man declare it unto you. So Paul uh, quoted Habakkuk here, but this, this here, this, this mighty uh, wonder, uh, this, this mighty act of deliverance was not like crossing the Red Sea or something like that, but this was judgment for Judah. That's what was coming. God says in verse six, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. So God is saying, I'm raising up the, ba the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, the same, the same people. You know, the Babylonians were um, uh, a very bitter and hasty nation, God says there, describing them. And verses seven to 11 describes the Babylonians. Now, we're not going to go at reading in detail, but we, we know that the, the Assyrians were very barbaric, and maybe they were the most barbaric above the Babylonians, but they were still very powerful. Uh, they became powerful in a very short time. And here he says they were a bitter and a hasty nation, and they were uh, known for their, their aggressive invasions of countries their cruel, barbaric behavior. And he's, he describes them. And we remember their king was Nebuchadnezzar, the, uh, the king that had was lifted up with pride. And, uh, and, and it calls them here swift and fierce and violent. And it describes them as a fisherman with a dragnet. You know, and it says of the, uh, the Babylonians how they would string up humans on a, like a, on a fish line. So they were very barbaric. And God says, I'm raising them up. I'm raising them up. This was God's doing. And in verse 11, it says that they're going to think it was them that gave them the victory. But no, God is allowing them to punish, to, to chastise his people. God is allowing them, even though they'll give credit to their gods, God is the one that is allowing this. So the good news is, you know, God is working, but the bad news is that he's going to use Babylon to render judgment on the children of Israel, on God's people. And he was saying, you know, Habakkuk, I'm working, just not the way you think I should. So just be, and just because we can't always see God at work doesn't mean he isn't working. You know, God says, look out, look out beyond your little world, Habakkuk. And I believe God could say that to us today. You know, look out beyond your little world. You know, I am, just because we don't see doesn't mean he's not working. Just because we don't understand doesn't mean that things aren't happening in the world. Now, in verse 12, or, uh, we see this answer really doesn't help Habakkuk here. He's, uh, he has a second question. And this second question is, how can a holy God use a wicked nation to punish his own special people. People Like this answer, Habakkuk wasn't really satisfied with, and it wasn't an answer at all in his mind. It just created a new problem for him. And how could a holy God use a wicked nation to punish his 
people. In verse 12, it says, Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my holy one? We shall not die, O Lord. Thou hast ordained them for judgment, and O mighty God, thou hast established them for correction. Thou art of pure eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and hold thy tongue when the wicked devoureth the man that is more righteous than he. So here he, he's, uh, he's saying, you know, how, why would God use this wicked nation to punish us? Uh, why would he use those barbaric, ruthless people to come and correct us Jews that are more righteous than they are? At least we're better than they. You know, he's saying, like, God, oh, why are you using them to judge us? And he, he understands what God's doing, but he just doesn't understand. He just can't harmonize uh, that with God's nature. You know, how he would use a Babylon nation that's mostly characterized by evil. How, can a, how could a holy God use a wicked nation to punish his own special people was just a, a struggle for him. Now, the first thing he's saying, you know, first thing he was saying, God, you're doing too little. Now he's saying, God, you're doing too much. Like, like, uh, like God's coming down with a, with a sledgehammer. You know, he wasn't asking for this. He was just asking to see justice in Jerusalem. And, and now, and not this. And that's when he says in verse 12 or verse 13, it, it's, uh, he says, you are too pure to stand by and let that happen. Like, God, you wouldn't do something like that. Uh, but the truth is, God did. God will. God, judgment did come. So now let's think about it a little bit. God uh, doesn't answer. Habakkuk had these questions, but God doesn't really answer the, uh, the questions, at least the why part of it. But maybe they, they, with, the second, with Habakkuk's second question, he says, okay, God, I don't understand all this evil and wickedness, but your answer is to, re- to use a really wicked people to deal with our little wickedness? That just doesn't make sense. And he, but he doesn't re- directly answer the why, at least the why part, but he answers the how. He tells them in, in the, uh, the next chapter, in chapter two, is how they are to live in difficult times. Uh, when when life doesn't make sense, you know the the just shall live by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. You know God is telling Habakkuk, just trust me, trust me. And and uh, when when Habakkuk trusted God, the questions went away. The questions went away, and then he bursts out in praise in chapter three. But chapter two, we see how Habakkuk trusts God. He trusts God. There's a process here that moved him from the questioning to the trusting. And we want to look at it a little bit closer here, how he moved from this questioning to trusting. And uh, we're going to see how he goes up in a watchtower. Let's read in verse chapter 2 and verse 1. It says, I will stand upon my watch and I will set upon the tower and will watch and to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer. And when, I, when I'm pr- reproved, he was expecting to be corrected. And the Lord answered me and said, write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he, that he may run that readeth it. For the visit, vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. Then verse four, behold his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. So the just shall live by his faith. So he goes up in this, we're we're talking about how he moved from this questioning to the trusting. And he goes up in a watchtower. He says, I'm going to seek my father and see what he will say. And he was waiting for an answer. You know, he started out in the valley. Now he's in the tower and we're going to see him end up in the mountaintop. Three things stand out that uh, when he goes up in the watchtower. Number one, we see that he was uh, the determination. He had a determination. I am going to seek the Lord. I will stand in my watch. God will answer a sincere seeker. Many examples of that in the Bible. Number two, we see the isolation. He was getting away. It's like going to a cabin, no Wi-Fi, no, no cell service, no distractions, and he was quiet. Quiet time, he quieted his heart in a quiet place, he had quiet time. We're talking about how Habakkuk moved to this 
uh, to this trusting stage. And then he had expectation. I will see what he will say. He believed that God was going to speak. He believed, you know, if we, if we believe that God's uh, going to speak and, and deal with us, he probably, he, he will. If we, if we say, if we think that he was not going to, well, he probably won't. He says, I'm going to seek God. I'm going to get away and I will hear what he will say that he's going to speak to me. That's faith that honors God. That's a spirit of expectancy. And God did answer. God did answer. He said in verse two, write the vision and make it plain. And what's the vision? The Babylonians are coming. The Babylonians are coming. Make it plain. It's like write it on a billboard that anybody that walks by can drives by can see it. Or maybe for today, it's put it on Facebook. The Babylonians are coming. That was like saying, Judgment is coming. That, and, uh, and make it plain. Don't beat around the bush. And it says in verse, in verse 3 there, it, it will come in his appointed time. You know, in, in, the first, in chapter 1, we see God telling Habakkuk, it'll come in his days, in his lifetime. It doesn't give a date, but he says it'll come in his day. So, and then we have, so that's the message. The Babylonians are coming. And then in verse 4, we have the anchor verse of this book. The anchor verse, it says, Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Here we have two groups of people. We have the proud on the one side, and we have the faithful on the other side. And it says, Behold, his soul. Whose soul? It's talking about the Babylonians. The Babylonians, the what God described in the second half of chapter 1. And especially Nebuchadnezzar, their king, he had a puffed up heart. Daniel 4 talks about him charioting around Babylon and saying, you know, look what I have done. And we see that the end result is that he was humble and God, he was, he ate uh, grass like an animal for seven years. But that's the contrast, the proud. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him. But the faithful, but the just shall live by faith. It's talking about walking by faith, not being puffed up with arrogance and abilities and whatever, but the just shall live by his faith. It's walking by faith. This is the anchor verse. This verse is quoted uh, other times in the New Testament here. But when we think about this verse in the New Testament, we think about this verse as, as uh, well, let's look at it in the, uh, it's quoted three times in, in Romans and in uh, there we see the, the, the just shall live by faith. And then we have it in um, Galatians and in Hebrews. So I don't want to get spend a lot of time there, but each, each one of these verses has a little different twist on the, uh, on the meaning. But in the original text, you know, this verse here was quoted by Martin Luther as the watchword for the Reformation. The just shall live by his faith, the doctrine of justi justification. But here in the original context in Habakkuk, where we find this verse, it has to deal with more on how to live in difficult times. When things get hard, when we go through trials and we go through tribulations, it's these times that our faith can waver and we can feel like giving up. We can feel like lose, losing out, like Psalm in, in Asaph in Psalm 73 talks about, I almost, my, my feet almost slipped. He almost lost out spiritually. And here the, the, the goal is that God is telling us that the just shall live by his faith. We, it's by faith. You know, uh, the, each one of the, uh, the uh, in, in Habakkuk here, we have to remember that Habakkuk had a lot of questions. He was searching for answers and he found his answer. He found his answer and it was right here. The just shall live by faith. Habakkuk was, Habakkuk was talking, was, was taking everything that God said to him and he was reasoning through it and he came to his own conclusion of how much that he ought to trust God. The only solution was trusting God. The just shall live by his faith. Living by faith, that's what God told him to do. It didn't answer the why part, but it answered the how. How he was to live. It didn't provide answers for his questions, but the, the questions went away. 
The questions went away. You know, when we realize that we can't change something or we can't fix something or we can't understand something, then all we have to do is lean on God, lean on Christ, trust him. And there's many verses, God's saying, I want you to trust me. God's telling Habakkuk and God's telling us today. And there's many verses through the Bible that will say this. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my tower. You know, it's the same for us. That is the answer. Some things in life will just not have easy explanations. You know, some things that we just won't understand. Maybe we won't understand everything. Maybe we won't like everything, but we, we're, go we, we're going to trust the Lord. We're going to trust the Lord. He's on the throne and he cares for me. This is, ex this is where Habakkuk eventually gets. He goes from the questioning to tr a full trust in the Lord and it's gonna change him. Now, in, uh, in, verses, in verses five to the end of chapter, in chapter two is five woes here. And uh, we're not gonna go into them, but this is, uh, it's talking about, if we go if I back up, we're talking about the puffed up soul. And these are five verses, five woes against the Babylonians. And God is telling Habakkuk, the Babylonians will be judged for certain glaring sins that they've committed. And then he goes on and comes to describes them in five woes in verses five to 19. And Lord, and Lord, 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 their greed and violence and covetousness and drunkenness and idolatry. But God's telling Habakkuk, judgment will come to the Babylonians too in God's time. Now I'd like to move forward to the last verse of chapter two and verse 20. And this is getting back to Habakkuk. I think this is his, his last step to fully trusting the Lord, though he had silence before God, silence before God. And the verse there in verse 20, it says, but the Lord in his holy temple, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silence before him. So now Habakkuk just heard all the woes that were pronounced against Babylon. And then we come to this verse here. It says, the Lord is in his holy temple be silent, be silent. He got to the place where he said, I know God is seated on the throne. And that's exactly where Asaph got to the place. He says, Asaph was, you know, how wide are the wicked prosper? And he almost lost his footing. And he comes to the place at the end of Psalm 73. And he says, until I went into the sanctuary of the Lord, then I understood their end. Then I understood till he saw the Lord. Habakkuk got a glimpse of God. He saw the Lord and he says, I need to be quiet. I need to be quiet. Silence before God. Did his vision of God bring the silence? You know, what, what do we think of silence today? Is silence worship? Can we be silent and worship? The Lord is in his holy temple be silent before him. Wasn't it Job that said, after God started speaking, he says, I, I, I will be silent. I will be silent. When he saw who God was. You know, I believe silence can be worship. I believe the Quakers had a period of silence in their worship service. But Habakkuk was silent and thought about all that God said. And when he was silent, he no longer had questions. He was no longer complaining. You know, after his period of silence, when he started talking again, we're going to see Habakkuk was a changed man. He started praising God. He was started singing, bursting out in worship. As I was silent before the Lord, he saw God on the throne in, con in control, in charge. And he burst out in praise. No more questions. They disappeared. And it brings us to the last point. You know, Habakkuk praises God. He went from that questioning to trusting, and now he bursts out in praise. Bursts out in praise. Now, how long did that take? We were going through it in a half an hour here, but how long did this take in Habakkuk's experience? You know, was it weeks? Was it months? Was it years? We don't know. But God, the goal is, God's goal is to get us to trust him. We can't change circumstances. We can't, we can stay in the questioning mode but we're only going to torment ourselves. 
We need to trust him and then we can rejoice. Then we can rejoice. It's not that we rejoice in the difficult circumstances. It's not that Habakkuk was rejoicing that the Babylonians are coming. But no, he's rejoicing in the Lord. He's trusting God with the circumstance. You see, he started out in the valley. He went up in the tower and now he's in the mountaintop. He started out saying, how long, God, till they got to the place I'm going to wait. I will wait. He had patience. You know, he's not questioning God now. He's not complaining, but he's praising God. And chapter three is largely a prayer song. And we don't have time to, to break down through it. But it's the climax of this little book. It's the climax. It shows us, he's pra- he shows us how he's praising God. And, it's, and it's, it shows us what trusting God looks like. It shows us what living someone that lives by his faith looks like. You know, this is a, a, a prayer song. In, uh, in verse 1, we see in chapter two, 3 and verse 1, it says the prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet of, of, uh, of uh, Shinoi or Shinoi, uh, or whatever. So that's a musical term, uh, some kind of it, it, musical term. So this is a song. And we see in the last, the last verse of, the, of uh, chapter 19 there, it says, in uh, chapter 3 and verse 19, it says he's talking to his chief singer on his stringed instruments. So this song, I believe, was intended to be sung with, with uh, stringed instruments. And in verse 2, it talks about how he was afraid and how he trembled. You know, as Habakkuk contemplated what God said, he confessed the report of what was going to happen uh, caused him to tremble. I heard your speech and it caused me to fear, it caused me to tremble. He realized that judgment and justice is coming for Judah. And he also realized that it's coming for Babylon. And then in verse two, he goes on and he says, you know, that he's pleading for mercy. He says, in wrath, remember mercy. You know, he's, he's asking God to be as merciful as he can when he comes in his wrath. He's not saying that God shouldn't bring wrath, but he's saying when you come in wrath, be as merciful as you can. So the, 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 the gist of this chapter three is, you know, he, the, the prayer song is he praises the person of God and then he praises the power of God. And then we see his, he praises the plan of God. He's praising God, he expresses a uh, strong faith in spite of unfavorable circumstances. And one thing that he recalls that you, we can look at is, is in the, the faithfulness of God in the past. You know, he says, since God is faithful in the past, I'm going to trust him in the future. And like for us today, I believe we can learn from that. You know, if we are troubled like he was, and we are at times, and one of the things that can help us to increase our faith is just to remember God's faithfulness on our lives in the past. God is faithful, and we can remember that. And that, and no matter what we're going through, the faithfulness of God in the past can be an inspiration and an encouragement to us. You know, Habakkuk is saying, Lord, I heard of your deeds and I stand in awe. You know, when I heard, I understood. He began to understand. And then we have this great confession of faith. This great confession of faith. You know, he literally applied what uh, he literally applied what he said when he said the just shall live by his faith. In verse 17 says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive oil shall fail and the fields shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the field and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk upon high places. This is one of the greatest confessions of faith in the Bible. I said one of them. But he literally applied what he said when the just shall live by faith. You know, the Babylonians, even if the Babylonians come and destroy everything, and that was their record, they had a scorched earth policy where they would, they would just wipe out all habitation of life, including plants and 
and says, if that happens, if the Babylonians come and destroy everything, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. You know, these verses in their original context is Habakkuk imagining what it's going to be like after the Babylonians come and they're finished. And he's saying, if there's no, if there's no uh, fig trees, if they're not blossomed, no fruit on the vine, no olives to eat, no uh, crops from the fields and no meat from the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. That's like us saying, <clears throat> Uh, if there's no food on the table, no money in the bank, yet I am going to rejoice in the Lord. Or we could bring it home farther. You know, though the grocery shelves be empty and the dollar inflates to 50 cents, I am going to rejoice in the Lord. You see, circumstances don't matter. Circumstances don't matter. Yet I will rejoice. I'm going to sing. And then the last verse there, it says in verse 19, he has footing like a deer. The Lord God is my strength and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon high places. You see, he's on a mountaintop now, like a deer climbing the cliffs. He feels lifted up. He's going to make my feet like the feet of a deer. He's, God is going to make sure that I have good footing. And if you're on a side like that, you, look at, you can admire how deer can climb the cliffs, right? Good footing. God is going to make sure I have good footing even when life is difficult. He's going to help me navigate those difficult places. You know, and it's a promise for us today. You know, God will keep our footing secure whether we are going from the valley up to the mountain or from the mountain to the valley. You know, if we live by faith, the just shall live by his faith. You know, from the valley to the mountaintop. You know, think about it. Habakkuk started out in chapter one, very depressed. He thought God wasn't doing anything. And now he's rejoicing and God didn't do anything yet, right? Judgment didn't come. What changed? His attitude changed. He was now living by faith, not by sight. It was a, it's an outstanding expression of faith that Habakkuk gives us here. You know, we can all probably identify with Habakkuk in some shape or form in some time of our lives. And, you know, whether whether you're in the questioning stage this morning, you know, and let me say it's okay to have questions. You know, no father despises the questions from his children, but rather welcomes them. But we, we should we must understand there's some things this side of heaven that we won't understand that we can't understand. And God doesn't owe us an explanation. God doesn't owe us an explanation. He owns everything. The earth is the Lord's and the fullest thereof. The only solution, like Habakkuk, is to simply trust God. Simply trust God. That's when peace comes. The peace that passes all understanding. The peace that can bypass our brain and go right, right in, settle right in. That passes all understanding. You know, Habakkuk went from questioning to praising from sighing to singing, and from wandering to worshiping, all because of his trusting. The just shall live by his faith. One thing yet, the, uh, this, I have it highlighted there, Hind's Feet, Hind, High Places. There's a book by that, that it's an old book, and uh, a very good book. It's an allegory like Pilgrim's Progress, taken from Habakkuk. Lessons we can learn. So, Let's, uh, let's remember, God wants us to simply trust him. The just shall live by his faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and love to us. Thank you for the examples that we have in your word that we can learn from. Lord, we thank you that Habakkuk was recorded in your scripture, that we can learn from him. Lord, that we think of uh, prophets that having everything together and and uh, But Habakkuk had questions for you, and you took the time and answered him. In the same way as we have our questions, you will take the time to answer us. We thank you for the example that we have from this book. Lord, I pray for each one that is here this morning. If anyone has is in the questioning stage, Lord, help us to move on to the trusting stage and to the praising stage. 
that we could uh, just simply trust you because you alone are trustworthy. Father, I thank you for each one that is here this morning. Make us a blessing. Help us to be a bright and shining light as we go through this week to come. We pray this in Jesus' worthy name. Amen.